All right, guys. Uh, so there's an actor strike that's been going on, um, where they're they're asking. I've been seeing a lot of it on my TikTok feed, and then somebody had sent me this video. It's uh, called the Hollywood Actor Strike Explained. It seems interesting. I saw Ron Perlman. Apparently, somebody like some executive at Disney or something said something like, "We'll just have to wait for them to like run out of money and they'll have to work." Which is so messed up. But let's see what we got here. The Hollywood Actor Strike Explained. Yeah. Welcome back to Nerdist News. I'm Dan Casey, and today we're taking another break from dissecting two first names. Wow, what a lucky guy, you know? Pop culture to talk about the most important things happening in the world of entertainment. Okay. Specifically, the writer's strike is now officially the writer's and actor's strike. Wow. As you may have heard, on Thursday, SAG, after the Screen Actors Guild American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, formally voted to go on strike. The Guild, which represents approximately 160,000 actors and performers, Damn. will join the writers on the picket lines where they've been protesting for 70 days and counting. Jesus. This is one of the biggest strikes in Hollywood history. It marks the first joint strike between the Actors and Writers Guilds in 63 years. And I remember when I was a little younger, because I'm, I'm old now, I'm 33. There was like a there was a writer strike too. There's always like a writer strike. Writers are always complaining, dude. I mean, Jesus, can you guys just shut up? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hey, listen, advocate for yourself, man. You know what's unfortunate, though? Is that, like, there are so many other industries that are doing so much worse. Like, I'm not trying to be rude, and I think it's fine for actors and whatnot to be like, hey, we'd like to have more money. I get it, and that's totally fine. You know, I'm not against it. I'm not against people advocating for themselves. But what's interesting is that you have people that are, like, in my opinion, doing objectively worse uh, like people at Amazon or at the grocery store at, or at fast food industries or at Walmart or at, but they just can't, they just can't go on strike because we as a, as people won't let them, you know, because that's actually, those are necessary industries. Like we need our Walmarts and our supermarkets and our fast food industry. Well, maybe we don't need a fast food, but you get my point. We need those people. Like if, you know, if they, if they get shut down, we're kind of SOL, but the movies and stuff, uh, what do we just have a, we just don't have a movie for a while. It's so uh, it's so interesting. Uh, it feels like we're almost only really only really willing to uh, let some people go on strike. It's interesting, you know. But okay, whatever. It's the first joint walkout since 1980. Whoa. After weeks of negotiating, SAG-AFTRA and the AMPTP, or the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, okay. failed to reach an agreement on key issues. The AMPTP, which represents studios like Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Disney, Warner Brothers Discovery, uh -huh. NBC Universal, Paramount, and Sony, is also on the opposing side of the writer's strike as well. This is the first time in 40 years that the Actors Union has called for a strike for this particular contract. During right. a press conference, SAG after President Fran Drescher and- That is Fran Drescher? I was like, wow, she looks a lot like Fran Drescher. That's so interesting. It's almost like how I look a lot like Papa Gut. Yes, that Fran Drescher said, What's happening to us is happening across all fields of labor. When employers make Wall Street and greed their priority and they forget about the essential contributors who make the machine run, we have a problem. Drescher continued by excoriating the greed of studio executives. I cannot believe it, quite frankly, how far apart we are on so many things. How they plead poverty, that they're losing money left and right when they're giving hundreds of millions of dollars to their CEOs. It's disgusting. You know, my thing is too, is like, do they really lose money though? My, like, okay, so Disney, people are like, oh, they, lo they lost money on this movie. They lost money on that movie. They lost money on this movie. Like my understanding, is it's not that they lost money on a movie. <clears throat> it's that they failed to instantly get their money back, right? Which I know sound like, oh, well, that's the same thing, Papa. I don't think so, right? Like, let's say you make a movie for $100 million, <clears throat> and you expect to make $100 million to make all your money back, and you don't do that in the opening weekend. These movies exist, <laughs> like, on their services still. They're still accumulating money, just because it may not do well in the box office doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to do well in general. Um, you know, and I feel like with the movie industry shifting where there's really not, how are you, dude, are you shitting me with a movie industry shifting where, um, you know, you're seeing less and less people actually going to the movies. Cause you know, you can watch them, you can watch them at home, you know, you're going to see a different business model for movies now. So I don't know. Are they really losing all this money? I just don't know if I believe that, you know, it's a long-term investment. Disgusting. Shame on them. They stand on the wrong side of history. 
The Actors Guild is protesting exploitative business practices created by the streaming economy. The issues being negotiated are very similar to those of the writers. One of the primary issues is dwindling residuals payments. Performers uh. receive these payments whenever a project they're in is syndicated, aired elsewhere, or reused by different entertainment networks. In 2022, writer Kira Jones illustrated how the issue of declining residuals affects screenwriters. On Twitter, she wrote, In case y'all are wondering why a WGA strike may be impending, my first residual check for the broadcast show I wrote on was $12,000. I just got my first residual check for my streaming show, $4. Because, folks, gone are the days where the cast of Friends makes millions and millions of dollars. Why is that, though? Like, why? why so here's your thing, right? Why is that? Is it because these businesses are greedy or is it just because things are changing? I mean, that's still not good. You know, you put something up on YouTube and you make pretty good money. But, um, you know, are people watching it? Like, what is the deal like? Because I know what, what cable television is. Let's be honest. It's always been a scam. Like, let's be real. You had to, you had to literally pay for cable and then watch commercials. That's insane. And the amount of commercials you watch is like what two minutes? Like, oh, it's uh, no, it's like fucking five, like seven minutes. I think every half an hour. That's, in that's insane. That's literally insanity. And they got away with it for so long, and now you don't do that. You know, you pay a monthly subscription for, like, Netflix or something. So is the issue... I mean, it has to be part of the issue. It has to be that there's just less money going around, right? That has to be part of it. No? I shouldn't do that. There's in syndication money. The New Yorker recently profiled cast members from Orange is the New Black. It was one of the first major hits of the streaming era, and something that put Netflix on the map. Actor Matt McGorry revealed, I kept my day job the entire time I was on the show because it paid better than the mega hit TV show we were on. That's crazy. Orange is the New Black star Kimiko Glenn really drove that discrepancy home in her viral TikTok from 2020. Is it in really In which that she bad? revealed a whopping $27.30 in residuals for what was ostensible. Uh, very serious question. I have the, that has nothing to do with anything right now, but do, can you make fan art of me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go for it. I don't care. Yeah, maybe you make whatever you want fan art of me. That'd be pretty cool. I'd appreciate that. Um, yeah, so what's the issue here? Is it like, are, do they just not have the money or what? Because my understanding is Netflix is like hemorrhaging money. Um, is Netflix losing money? So like if Netflix doesn't have money, it's losing popularity. But does that mean it's, is it in, is it losing money? Because so I mean, I guess I... Netflix may see a $3 billion increase in revenue. Oh, wait, what? Wait, so if they're not in the red, I don't know. This stuff, like, how much does Netflix make a year? How much net profit Netflix? Uh, 2022, we could look up. Wait, they made 2.7. Wait, this is insane, actually. Wait, Netflix made $4.4 billion in net profit. Net profit is like, is, is profit after. Wait, net, what? is net profit net profit is profit after you've paid your your expenses right yet yeah, what they made 4.4 billion dollars net profit in 2022 and that was the first decline wait what the fuck wait how much does netflix ceo make a five hundred thousand dollar base salary plus 2.5 million dollars in stock options is that a, that's a lot Oh, oh, what the fuck? Jesus Christ. Why aren't they paying people? Like, I under, like, I feel like it should be almost like YouTube. You know, you pay, you pay people a, like, why not set aside certain revenue and then give people a, a percentage of that revenue? Like, I, I don't know how they do it, you know, but why not make it so like, hey guys, we collected $10 billion this year. What we're going to do is we're going to set aside seven of that billion dollars to split between all the TV shows based on how well they do. And if you get 1% of all the total um, views on YouTube, you get 1% of $7 billion, which is what, $70 million or seven. And then you take that 70, I hope I'm doing my math right. And then you take that $70 million and then you diversify, you, you split it up between the people who watch. You know what I mean? Like, that's, doesn't that make sense to me? You know? Something like that makes the most sense to me. How do they do it? They're just not paying people? <laughs> They're fucking stupid.
ostensibly one of Netflix's biggest shows. <sighs> and more recently, as Matt Damon explained at the Oppenheimer premiere in London, it's not about greed. Rather, it's the difference between having healthcare and not for a lot of working actors. Now, sag aftras proposed solution to the issue of decline. Oh, is he saying that um, it's about like people need that money so that they can afford healthcare? Oh, shit. Is that what they're saying? I mean, I guess that makes sense. YouTube, give me health care. Give me a uh. residual payments is to increase base compensation for performers. They also want to instate performance based bonuses if something does really well on a streaming platform. But that's a matter that's complicated by streaming networks and their staunch refusal to provide any sort of meaningful insight into their performance metrics. Because unlike television ratings, which are more easily measured by third party organizations like Nielsen, streaming oh. networks keep their numbers in a proverbial black box. Why? Because, well. say, for the sake of art. <laughs> why? Uh, I wonder why. So that they can do, like, dude, I'm not eating poop. I, I, probably so that they can uh, take as much money as they want from people. <laughs> that makes the most sense to me. That's really scummy, dude. What the fuck? I feel like the internet is so much like cheaper to run anything that it makes like, it's just so. Sh why? Why? I don't understand the fundamentally why screw over your actors and whatnot. Like, I don't understand. Like, wouldn't you want them to be happy? Wouldn't you want them to be wanting to make stuff on your platform? And is this an issue across platforms or is it just like a Netflix thing and a Disney thing? Is there a Hulu problem here too? I guess Hulu's TV though, right? Hmm, okay. If the actual viewership numbers on a project are lower than are presented to shareholders, well, that would have catastrophic effects on a streamer's share price, just for the sake uh, of a hypothetical okay. argument. I see. Now, so they're, much like the okay, so their argument is we're not gonna tell the numbers because it could hurt our quarterly stock price or whatever. That's insane. That's insane. What a bullshit excuse. It's so crazy because one of the biggest issues is people will hyper focus on the short term gains. Um, people will hyper focus on those short term gains and then they won't have long term positive business effect. But like, wouldn't you want to pay your people decently? Don't you want happy, happy people who work for you? I mean, a hot take, but like that just makes things easier. No. One of the major sticking points for SAG after and their negotiations is the use of artificial intelligence. Actors want to have control over how their likeness and voice are used by studios. That way they aren't turned into virtual meat puppets against their will. Mm. But perhaps the most galling of all is the AMPTP so-called groundbreaking AI proposal. According to sag afters National Executive Director and Chief Negotiator Duncan Crabtree Ireland, studios basically wanted to pay background extras for one day's work and own their likeness forever. They pro What? That's fucking crazy. It's great for the Hollywood studios propose that they should get the own actors AI replicants forever. That's fucking nuts. Dude, that's crazy. Technology is so scary. You know? Like, for real, it's actually pretty scary stuff, man. And, and technology's great, right? Like, look at what I'm doing right now. I'm literally watching a video on YouTube while playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on my PlayStation 5. And I'm going to upload this video on YouTube and I'm going to make money on it. And I'm going to be a happy guy. And there's so there's great parts to it, but then there's also bad parts to it. And like here's here's part of it because now we have to have Congress and, and whatnot and the government get into control here, or I guess they can have the union negotiations. They have to they have to get in here and be like, okay, this is what should be allowed, this is what shouldn't be allowed. But the fucking politicians are so behind on everything that it's like impossible to like do this correctly because they fucking dog shit when it comes to anything. They just take their oh, what the fuck, okay. They, they're just so dog shit about it that we're like never going to get an answer. Or it's going to take years to be to deal with something that needed to be dealt with like, you know, yesterday. Oh, my God. Yeah. Black Mirror in real time. Background extras for one day's work and own their likeness forever. They propose that our background actors should be able to get scanned, get paid for one day's pay. Why? And their company should own that scan, their image, their likeness, and to be able to use it for the rest of eternity in any project they want with no consent and no compensation. That's crazy. Not even just because they get to own their likeness for like forever, but because isn't that the buy-in? Aren't you told as like an extra, like for the most part, if you're an extra, you're probably either you're just trying to make like a, a, some extra money for a day or you're somebody who wants to make a career out of this. But that's the buy-in. Hey, we're going to pay you a little bit of money 
um, because you being an extra or a background character in a movie might land you a bigger role. So you get paid a little bit. Your likeness is used, but also your personality gets to shine through. And now they're just like, nah, fuck it. We're just going to superimpose your face onto my ball sack and make it look like a person. Like you, you, you remove the buy-in. It, that's like that's like uh, like unpaid interns. It's like yeah, you're an unpaid intern, but at least you're closer to us here. But it's like you're getting you're getting rid of people's ability to even do the buy-in in the first place. And of course, they're not going to take the money that they save on background extras and pay their actors, their writers, the the the, the people who do CGI. All these other people. they're not paying them more. They're taking that money and they're siphoning it up to the top, and they're just going to eat that money. They're going to fucking they're going to buy just bullshit with it. They're going to jerk themselves off. And they're going to donate something to charity and say, look, I'm a great guy. I donated a million dollars in charity this year. Meanwhile, they just made an extra ten million dollars off a of fucking some like poor love in the ass like just a bunch of fucking people in the asshole it's crazy dude and frankly that's wild <sighs> but the actors joining the writers on their strike changes everything this strike effectively halts production across much of the industry previously some productions like deadpool 3 were proceeding with filming despite not being able to do any rewrites or improvisation on set they had to stick to the script they already had but with the actors now on strike well that's a dumb idea damn they're really they, they care so little that they'll destroy their project potentially because like you obviously want to have the the room to be able to make a rewrite Right? Rewrite? Just in case something doesn't really work out, you want to have the actors able to be there so that they can help you potentially rewrite the script so that you have a better quality movie that stands the test of time instead of something that you pump out and nobody gives a shit about in five days. Isn't that the goal? I mean, I thought it was. What happened to like that? What happened to companies giving a shit about the long-term um, impact of their stuff? I mean, same thing with like World of Warcraft and Blizzard. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they don't get it's, it. Just feels like nobody cares anymore. No movie studios, no video game studios, no any studios gives a shit about anything anymore. They're just like fucking content machines. It's like a bunch of pop of guts out here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why don't these guys have guns? By the way, you don't probably jumped over that. Why don't you have a gun? Like, just shoot me. I'm I'm a fucking woman with a microphone, bro. Strike sets will now no longer have performers either. Which who are some of the big actors? I saw um, Ron Perlman. That's uh, that's it, and I think Hassan Piker. <laughs> I saw him out there. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know with Adam ru ruins everything. I saw him with them. So. Kind of need to make a movie. Now, even so, some international productions will continue unabated. HBO and Max shows like House of the Dragon and Industry will continue shooting in the UK. Okay. And that's because projects like House of the Dragon feature predominantly British casts uh. who are working under equity contracts rather than SAG after contracts. Equity, for those who don't know, is the UK Actors Union. And with that said, Equity did issue a statement saying they stand in solidarity with SAG AFTRA. But they also noted they are subject to, quote, draconian legislation regarding what they can and cannot do. According to Deadline, whether the cast of the show would want to work under the current conditions isn't known, but the UK has strict anti-trade union laws that do not allow for members to strike in unity with other counterparts in other countries. Why? <laughs> what the fuck? That's insane. That's just fucking stupid. That just feels like it's illegal. We made a law that makes it so that other this is that's insane. Im imagine making it illegal to like <laughs> just making it illegal for people to advocate for themselves. The only reason that that exists is so that that movie industries can continue can either the, the real reason that this exists, in my opinion, is so that a movie uh, industry or whatever can be like, oh, you know what, we're just gonna go to another country and start filming there. So this way, we don't want you guys striking together. It's illegal. <laughs> Why do you mean it's illegal? How does that make? Is it illegal? What? It doesn't make any sense, or it's against the laws that to work under the current conditions isn't known. But the UK has strict anti-trade union laws that do not allow. It's the you. It's it's crazy that the actual country has a law that prevents you from advocating for yourself in unison with other countries. Holy fuck! This seems like really fucked up, dude. This is messed up. I mean, it's like if you work for a certain store, like let's say you work for a Starbucks and they're treating you like shit. They're like not paying you for overtime and all this other stuff. And then you're like, I'm going to go on strike. And then your fellow Starbucks is like, we can't. We'd go to jail for it. Not not that it's against company policy. You will, you'll go to jail for it. It's like, okay, well, so basically what you're doing is you want be, people to just be able to go to a different Starbucks while you're protesting, which significantly reduces their, your ability to protest, right? It just seems crazy that that's illegal allow for members to strike in unity with other counterparts in That's other countries. That's wild.
The strike will also bring any major film festivals, awards campaigns, press junkets, and other promotional cycles to a screeching halt, as union members take to the picket lines to protest against exploitative business practices. Case in point, the cast of Oppenheimer, they straight the up left that? the London premiere as soon as the strike was announced. It was happening when they announced it. It also means that San Diego Comic-Con may actually be about comics for a change, because neither writers nor actors can promote their projects in Hall H or beyond. Now, as for how uh, this will affect your viewing habits, well, the effect... You know, I was thinking about going to Comic-Con this year, just for like a day, just so that I can check out the venues with my wife, maybe buy some uh, Loungefly, you know what I mean? I don't know if you guys know this, but I love Loungefly stuff. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know this at all. Dude, are you kidding, kidding me? You kicking me? Um, but I was thinking about buying stuff like that, so... Effects may not be felt at first because studios still have projects in the pipeline. But as production comes to a halt, that throws the future of their business model into jeopardy. And in the world of business, you're only as good as your last quarter, especially if you're beholden to shareholders. That's why and with projects grinding to, to a halt, studio execs will surely be feeling increased pressure to return to the negotiating table in good faith before they too may find themselves out of a job. Well, assuming they can come down from their ivory towers, that is. Ooh, because hours em. before f***ing around intersected with finding out, Disney CEO Bob Iger made an appearance on CNBC's Squawk Box. That is, before returning to the Sun Valley Conference in Idaho, which is colloquially referred to as a summer camp for billionaires. Now, Iger, who could be paid as much as $27 million this year, recently signed a new deal to keep running That's Disney it. through 2026. He described the level of expectation that striking writers and actors have have as just not realistic. And that's particularly rich considering that Iger is one of eight studio execs who made a collective $773 million in 2022, while other workers struggle to pay their bills. Now, the only one thing I want to say to that is this, right? Like Disney is a lot more than just movies, right? So I don't know. Listen, they made it paid a lot of money. I'm sure that they could come up with more money for people in movies. Let's be real. However, that being said, there's something to be said, like, I, they, I, you know, Bob Iger doesn't just make money from Disney movies. Bob Iger makes money from Disney parks, which is like seven of them, or actually maybe eight of them across the world. He makes money from the merchandising and brand deals, and the video games, right? I'm not saying they can't afford the money. I'm just saying that um, they're getting money from more than just from just the movies. You know, Disney is like its own fucking entity. So, but it is really shitty to be like, yeah, I'm going to go on vacation while you can't pay your bills. You know, it's just, it is shitty. While all this has been happening, industry trades... And honestly, not, not to be, not to continuous, continuously blabber on, but, you know, a lot of this to me, too, is an issue... Okay. Is an issue with, like, um... Yeah, I know it's going to sound like cringe, but if we had a better tax uh, structure for rich people to pay their tax, like, their fair share, this really wouldn't be much of a problem, right? I mean... Because that's part of the problem here is that rich people don't pay their fair share of taxes. If we were able to take that and then like to implement some kind of like a universal basic income or something, um, we wouldn't necessarily have to worry about this because people would already have like a, a baseline some income. You know, that's a whole different conversation to have. You know, but uh, yeah, I think it's I think there's something to it. I think that there's something to that. Several pieces that kind of feel like they're placed by studio reps from the AMPTP. One deadline article, perhaps intended to demoralize striking writers, contained an absolutely ghoulish sentiment from unnamed studio executives. The article read, The end game is to allow things to drag on until union members start losing their apartments and losing their houses. Acknowledging the that should just be illegal. <laughs> cold as ice approach, several other sources reiterated mm. the statement. It's just what? my thing. What if we took the money from the rich, not all of it, we, we were able to collect better taxes from rich people and use that to implement different programs that made it easier to be a person. So like, oh man, I'm only getting paid this much per set, but then you also have like a guaranteed universal the basic income so that you don't have to necessarily worry. Um, You know what I mean? Then you don't necessarily have to worry about increasing their pay because they have a guaranteed income on top of their pay. Right. One insider called it a cruel but necessary evil. Do you know how cartoonishly diabolical you sound? F*** you. And that sentiment seems to imply the strike might not be over anytime soon. I've heard rumors running the gamut from August to December as far as how long this strike could last. It's part scare tactic to discourage writers and actors who are hurting financially, and part war of attrition. But unfortunately for studios, in this war, it increasingly seems like they're only shooting themselves in the foot. Anyway, folks, there you have it. That's a brief overview of everything Sounds you like need to know. Sounds like socialism? Good. <laughs>
does that, what does that even mean? About the actor strike. Godspeed and solidarity with all of the actors, performers, yeah. writers, and other hardworking industry professionals. Police officers are socialism. Taking money and then implementing social programs is socialism. Who cares? who are busy campaigning for... Oh, that's not what socialism is, but that might as well be what it is now to conservatives, so... ...for treatment and equitable wages. And if you live in places like L.A. or New York, then please consider joining the picket lines yourself. If you live in places like L.A. or New York, please consider leaving. <laughs> okay, let's just And if you're thinking of crossing the picket lines to take this as your big chance to break into the industry, I don't know, buddy, maybe pump the brakes, because that's what's known as scabbing. And what Ooh. do scabs ultimately do? They... It just leads to more scabs, because when you pick Pick at them. It's terrible. Well, they're disgusting lumps of skin that dry up and fall off. Anyway, folks, thank you so much. Would the companies make that excuse for why they shouldn't pay as much? Probably. Yeah, sure. There's never going to be like 100% positive in anything that you ever do. So, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. The idea is like you're getting more pros out of something than cons. Much for watching. And as always, for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, make sure you stay tuned to Nerdist.com. Okay. Hey, good time to be a YouTuber, am I right?